So when we think about how good plants are, one of the things that we always think about are these plants that we put in our house and they're going to improve the air quality to them. Well, one thing I'd like to kind of burst your bubble with is a lot of the studies that have shown kind of indoor air improvements based on these house plants really haven't been that good, well done studies. In fact, most of our good studies have showed that air quality doesn't really depend a lot on house plants. It depends on things like making sure your um, you clean your filters and your furnaces, or even more to the matter, to kind of the kind of larger societal issues that we have with smog reduction that we need to do, especially in our area here in Utah Valley. So when we think about you die cots, which you means good, we should really think about of them and not necessarily these what they're doing for us but kind of what that actually means when we talk about a good die cot and even beyond that though many of the you die cots out there are really important economically for us so really in every sense of the word these groups of die cots that we'll be talking about today are very good so the you die cots are our final group that we're going to really take up and so far in our angiosperms, we've talked about these early angiosperms, such as the magnolias and the ANA grades, as well as the monocots. And the eudicots are kind of the rest of the big clades here. This is by far the largest group of angiosperms, and of course, angiosperms are the largest group of plants. And they compose about 70% of all angiosperms um, on total. And we distinguish them from being different than dicots, because if you remember, the ANA grade, the magnolias, are have those two cotyledons on them. Where somewhere in here on our phylogeny, especially going up this way to the monocots, they lost one of those cotyledons there. And so now we see again a whole group that's diversified with those two dot those two cotyledons. So these are dicots. But we want to distinguish them to make a good clade with a common ancestor as the eudicots. The eudicots consist of four main groups themselves that we'll talk about. This kind of really weird order here, the Ceratophyllales, which is an entirely aquatic group. The early diverging eudicots, this kind of large group here that includes a lot of species of temperate areas, um, but a lot of tropical ones as well. And then the super rosettes, which are all related to roses, and the super asters, which are related to the mega family, the Asteraceae. So those two cotyledons don't really make this group because remember, some of those earlier diverging angiosperms have two all as well. But there's one trait that the eudicots have in common, and it's kind of a really uh, kind of a trait that you would miss if you weren't looking for it. In fact, you really need a scanning electron microscope to find this trait. And this trait is called a triculpi. And what these are, a, tri a, a culpi is a structure on the pollen grains, and they allow to small uh, pores there. And these pores are really handy for these pollen grains because as they uh, land on the female stigma, it's going to allow a good surface for that gen genetic material to emerge from that pollen grain and start to put that into the ovule. And what we see in the eudicots is that they have three of these kind of bands on it, that these weaknesses on the pollen grain. And the reason why we think that this is such a common trait in most plants is because the odds of making contact with that pollen grain and getting your genetic material into the female reproductive structure are highly, highly increased when you have these bandings. But this kind of three shape to it also allows for a lot of protection of the pollen grain itself. So we think this is a really handy trait, but a very small one that doesn't make a lot of um, you know, magazine pages, but really has a very significant biological um, um, markings on the world we live in today. So the first group of the eudicots to talk about is kind of another mysterious group that we've really struggled with where it actually belongs. And this is the ceratophyllales um, that's represented by the genus Ceratophyllum. 
Um, this is a very common aquatic plant. Um, if you go out east or even around here, you're likely to find this plant growing in kind of aquatic informations. But the problem with this plant that we've had is that aquatic lifestyle really kind of erases a lot of unique morphology because you're trying to adapt to a very specific area and aquatic plants don't need a lot of traits that other land plants do. And so we've struggled to like put this in relationship, like is it a true eudicot? Some people have even put it as a monocot in some cases. Um, the traits that we use to kind of decide where things are are absent in this. These don't have veined leaves. There's no veination in them because they can just move water and sugars readily through their bodies. They also do have two cotyledons, but these are very, very much reduced. In fact, seed is a very uh, poor way for this plant to disperse. And it wasn't until fairly recently we were actually able to find some of these viable seeds in this plant. And also the pollen in it is very structureless and very plain. We don't see those actual ridges, those colpi that we see in other plants there. And that's really good for aquatic lifestyle because you don't, you're just kind of floating in the water um, hoping to get to a female um, ovary on there. Um, but it's hard for a taxonomist because we can't interpret this a lot. Right now, we currently place this group as sisters to all you dicots, but if you're trying to like really keep up and learn the names of all these plants, this is a good one to kind of put an asterisk next to because it's likely to change in the next few years. So at the base of these kind of early diverging eudicots, one of the families that we see and one of the orders that especially that's important around here is the ranunciales or the buttercups. And these are, this is a relatively small order, only about seven families, but about 400 or 4,500 species in it. And one of the things that's really known about the buttercups are their alkaloids they have. And alkaloids are a, a class of chemical compounds that have nitrogen on them. And those nitrogen compounds in these classes are really good at hurting mammals in particular to them. Because nitrogen is a very sticky molecule that likes to bind to things, especially oxygen receptors, which can be very problematic for an animal that needs to breathe in oxygen and bind that oxygen to um, blood cells and get it to other areas in your body. And because of this, the ranunculaceae is kind of known for being kind of a bad forage plant, especially for animals. If you ever look out onto a range and you see this in the spring, these kind of all this yellow here, and most of them are gonna be buttercups, what you can assume is that range has been overgrazed by that cattle, leaving only the unpalatable and frankly dangerous ranunculaceae present there. Um, the name ranunculaceae comes from um, ranus, uh, which is a genus of frogs, because the leaves kind of have these frog-like shapes to it, and they're also associated a lot of times with wetland habitats. The other really kind of fun thing that we see with the early diverging dicots is something to do with their leaves. A lot of these leaves, especially in these ranunculus um, groups, are really quick to decompose, a much, much quicker than things like a pine needle or a big, thick evergreen leaf um, that you might see in a magnolia. And this leaf de decomposition was probably first kind of derived in this clade. And when this kind of evolved on our earth, it really transformed a lot of our ecosystems, particularly our freshwater aquatic ecosystems. Many of them today depend on leaves falling into them and the series of organisms kind of eating and destroying those leaves and changing that energy flow as we go down through a river. We call this the river continuum hypothesis. And by these kind of chemical changes in these leaves to make them, probably the plants were trying to make them faster, putting less reinforcement structure into them, has allowed that to really shape these communities. And communities are able to use these kind of energy inputs, even though they might not have a lot of good stuff in them, but able to make uh, whole food chains based on these. And that trait really most likely derived right here when the ranunciales came onto the scene. Our next big group in the eudicots are the super rosids. 
And when I talk about the super rosettes, um, I'm talking about more than just these kind of lovely things we are kind of marketed to give to uh, the people we care about in our lives. Because the super rosettes contain about 88,000 species, which is a quarter of all gymnosperms belong in this. And they include a very diverse group of families that, and groups that we use for another different things. For instance, the sassafrage family, a very important species at higher elevations and into the Arctic. The fabaceae, or the peas, one of our most important agricultural families. The roses, a very diverse and fun family of temperates that I personally love. The cucurbits, which are popular around Halloween time because they include things like pumpkins. And then, of course, mustards, like your fast plants, and the malvies, which include things um, such as marshmallows. In the super group, in this super group, um, the sassafrage alleys are one that I personally like a lot because I come from a very more northern spot and spend a lot of times up at higher elevation. And a lot of the members of this family grow in these habitats. Um, there, a lot of them are small plants that grow close to the ground, won't really get them of even a couple inches, a lot of them. But this kind of short habitat really allows them to do well in areas that get snow and get a lot of shearing winds because they can just stay to the ground, grow really quickly when this growth season's there, and then kind of stay underneath the snowpack um, during these inhospitable conditions. We also see the sassafrage are really good at living in acidic conditions. And one of the things that we see in this order is that living in these acidic conditions um, also has a lot to do with your nutrition you're able to pull up. Because if you're in acidic, um, the chemistry doesn't work out and there's a lot of things you can't just get from the soil. And at the same time, a lot of these plants tend to have really sticky leaves to them. And we actually believe that because of these kind of two conditions, it really has made this group very prone to diversifying and to a kind of um, a, a become our carnivorous plants in this, um, this kind of um, two different kind of neat traits it has. But probably economically to us, the most important group in the super roses is the Fabaceae. Um, they're the third largest family of plants by species, over 19,000 or so. Depending on how you chop it up, probably only the orchids and the asters are more diverse than this group. And this diversity in species is really um, also shows up in its wide ecological diversity too. Um, for instance, the acacias are common plants in a lot of areas of sub Saharan and Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as here in the American West. We have quite a few of our trees are of the Fabaceae. And they also have incredibly diverse morphology, everything from vines to shrubs to really pretty massive trees in some cases. But really where they um, really kind of shine is their importance in agriculture. Things like soy, beans, alfalfa, and a lot of our tropical plants like tamarind come from this big family. And this big family is known for, especially one of their kind of neat flower shape they have, where they have this kind of big banner here, and then this kind of sack that holds all their reproduction stuff in it. And you can just imagine the joy of a bumblebee flying in and getting, trying to get to the nectar source held way back here in the calyx. Another interesting thing about the Fabaceae that really is important for our agriculture system is that many members of the Fabaceae are also able to fix nitrogen in the soil. So most of the time in our ecosystem, nitrogen is unavailable because it's in a triple bond with itself um, in locked away forms. But there's a lot of bacteria that can actually break that bond and turn that nitrogen into a biologically available compound. And a lot of our um, Fabaceae, especially some of our agricultural plants, are able to do this. They're able to store that bacteria in these little nodules here. And you can see that those nodules have a little red pigment to it. And that's where that kind of actual nitrogen fixation is occurring here. Um, during um, kind of the reconstruction during in the Southeast United States and really into recent times, agriculture has kind of decimated that area and really drained those soils of a lot of important nutrients. 
And one of the big contributions um, to science uh, that George Washington Carver did was he realized that we needed a way to kind of fix these soils, especially from this kind of poor cotton management that we had. And he promoted the use of using peanuts in order to do that because they had a lot of things you can make products out of them as well as they had this nitrogen fixing capacity. In fact, a lot of agriculture practices today during crop rotation usually put in a Fabaceae member in order to kind of reinvigorate um, that soil. And of course, the super rosids are named after the Rosaceae. Um, this really big family um, that isn't as big as some other families, but about 5,000 species. But I think they punch way above their weight because they're really iconic. If you think about all the members of the rosaceae, they're things like apples, roses, strawberries, pears, raspberries, all these wonderful fruits and things that we cultivate and give to each other. In fact, my favorite plant, Ruvus parviflorus, um, the thimbleberry um, is in this group. And the rosaceae have been a really important temperate crop for a long time, really since global trade even started. Um, a really good example of this is the domestication of apples. Apples come from a, co are a combination of a couple species that are found in kind of Central Asia. And during early trade with Asia and Europe along the Silk Road route, these kind of wild apples start to get carried around, especially thinking about things that were tart or sweet, ones that had that crisp texture you like. And during this extensive trading, these plants were getting moved as well. These traders would kind of stop in, find things, move them along. And we think that kind of the origin of our modern apples kind of came across when we had this kind of combination of these new traits that ended up somewhere in kind of the Balkans or the Middle East area. And once these, were, these good varieties were found, we started grafting them and moving them around even more and extensively breeding them. And eventually it would bring us to kind of our present day apple situation that we have with some stops of making apple cider along the way. The cucurbitaceae um, are a really fascinating group and one that I'm personally interested in and I'm trying to grow a lot of new varieties of this family today. But they include all these kind of big gourd kind of stuff, things like cucumbers, squashes, watermelons, pumpkins, honeydews, everything kind of fits into there. These have a lot of tremendous economic impact. In fact, they're the staple food of a lot of cultures and people around the world. But I really think the really where they shine is their cultural importance. If you just look around during October, um, around here, you can see there's pumpkins displayed everywhere because they have a lot of significant cultural meanings to us. And this cultural meaning also was more of kind of a vital survival point for a lot of our indigenous cultures, especially in North America. The cucurbitaceae are a really important member of kind of traditional agriculture settings, especially they become one of what we call the three sisters where we had these um, native agriculture systems where they would grow together beans, squash, the cucurbitae, and corn of the poaceae. And the idea with these systems was, is you could kind of have this kind of agricultural system where the cucurbits would grow low and maybe, um, and kind of keep out weeds that would come in and invade these things. The beans would be able to grow up the stalks on the corn, and the corn, of course, would provide this kind of um, overall structure for these plants to grow in. And there's been a lot of interest in kind of this agriculture system too. Um, in fact, even today, you can go to most seed companies and they will sell you a Three Sisters garden in a can. The next big order we have in the Eudicots, or the next big clade, is the Super Asterids. And if you thought the super rosids were a big group, they the super asterids really put that group to shame. Um, there is over 120,000 species here and by far the biggest uh, related clade within the eudicots and over 20 orders. And in this, we have some really iconic groups such as the ericales, which include things like blueberries and heaths, as well as some carnivorous plants. We also have the lamiales, which is personal favorite of mine that include the monkey flowers as well as mints. 
The solan alleys, which include things like eggplant and tomatoes, as well as a host of other native species in our area. And then the aster alleys, which include um, our iconic sunflowers and other uh, related species to it. And I'm going to highlight only a few of these kind of groups within the super asterids. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I kind of picked and choose my favorite here. But the lamb alleys uh, include their mints and their relatives. And these are plants that we're all familiar with because they have these really neat kind of floral shapes that they look like a little mouth to them in a lot of ways. And these kind of mouths, these faced flowers, are really just five petals all fused into a tube. Interestingly, all the members of the lamialis have opposite leaves. So their leaves grow out just dichotomously opposed to each other instead of what we would call alternate, where they're ranked up the stem. Um, again, these include lots of things like monkey flowers, which I study, snapdragons, oleanders, and begonias are all in this kind of really large order. But the reason why we know mints so well isn't just because they have these neat little flowers, um, but we know them because they have secondary metabolites. So they produce these compounds that aren't necessarily important for their basic physiological functions, but they give the plants some kind of ecological adaptations that allow them to be successful. And these products that they produce are generally edible for us, and they're also very aromatic. We can smell them. Next time you see some mints, grab a whole handful, crush them up, and just smell them, and you'll clean out your airways really fast there. And what you're smelling is these little packets of concentrated liquid in the plant. And these, this liquid is usually hydrophobic and also extremely volatile. So it's easy to evaporate and give that smell that we see. Probably the most famous secondary compound that's produced is menthol or mint. And what this um, product does though, that's kind of interesting and why it has this kind of cooling effect is that it interferes with cold receptors that mammals have. And this interference kind of changes how you're perceiving or how those cold receptors are actually perceiving things. And this works a lot like a lot of capsicum does or things like that, that you would get in a pepper. Um, but it's at a little less of a higher dosage, and so um, we use these kind of secondary metabolites quite a bit. But of course, they don't produce it for us, and these secondary metabolites are very important in interactions of pollinators and herbivores, too. Um, a lot of these secondary metabolites are kind of inducers to get pollinators to come to their flowers and to uh, pollinate them. And slight changes in the chemical compound can change what pollinator is coming to you. So it's often thought of as a source of speciation, one of the reasons why there's so many species in the lamialis. We also see that even in the leaves, when they damage, those leaves have very volatile um, emissions. We call these volatile organic compounds. And these compounds, once they get released, can get picked up not just by you and I, but a whole slew of other things. Herbivores can kind of see that and say, that's a well-defended plant because it smells good. I'm going to stay away from it. But the enemies of these herbivores can say, well, something damaged that plant, so I'm going to go investigate, and maybe I can find some food that's eating that plant. And also, other plants can understand that. And those volatiles can kind of, uh, when they reach another neighboring plant, the plant can say, well, something's chewing on leaves in my neighborhood, so I better upregulate particular genes to prepare myself for potentially getting attacked. And so these organic, volatile organic compounds um, really are kind of an exciting new field that a lot of people are looking at, especially their ecological interactions and possibly their use at controlling some of the pest issues we have in some of our agriculture systems. And then, of course, the super asteralis is named because of the asteralis. And this asteralis is really a large group because it's composed of one of our largest groups of plants, the sunflower family. And they're about 14% of all eudicots. And the asteraceae is a really interesting group, because not just because of its huge size, but because of its really unique flowers that it has. 
would they have a composite flower? So when you're looking at the sunflower, it's actually made up of many different flowers. This group is mostly composed of herbs and easily kind of dispersed uh, plants, but we also see a significant number of them are shrubs, so especially like around here in Utah, but there are also a few trees in this family that we find usually on islands, which is kind of a unique thing about the asters uh, family. But the Asteraceae is likely so diverse because of a few key traits. Um, their composite flowers um, allow them to have a multiple different relationships with pollinators and a lot of easy pollination. And what we see in these is we see kind of a central receptacle with individual flowers poking up made of what we call ray flowers, which are the little flowers in the center and, um, or excuse me, Disc flowers, which are the flowers in the center, and ray flowers, which are these kind of typical petals. So this summer, when you see a sunflower, get up and look at it really closely, and you'll notice all these different disc and ray flowers in there. But probably one of their most important traits that they have that have made them such a successful group is their seed. And all these flowers are going to bear individual little seeds that we term achenes. And on top of those akenes, they're attached a pappus bristle. And these little bristles here are, are able to attach, um, are able to be modified quite a bit. Most of the time they just get blown away in the wind, which allows them to have very long distance dispersal, like we see in dandelions. But a lot of them can have uh, adaptations that allow them to stick to passing animals. Or even some of them, and especially in the genus Bidens, can actually have them actually promote the seed to get stuck into animals. In fact, fish are often uh, an a, a unfortunate side product of those where a lot of these uh, seeds can get embedded in a fish and if that fish dies and goes on shore, that seed has a nice rotting fish to kind of grow up in. And this reflection, is, this is really reflected in the diversity of the Asteraceae. Um, a lot of them mix these different types of flowers. So for instance, this pineapple weed, which is, makes a wonderful little tea, um, has only disc flowers. But things like some of our dandelion relatives have only um, ray flowers. And then we see all the differences in between them. And so this akeen and these pappus bristles have really made the Asteraceae probably one of our most group, diverse groups we have. So in a quick review, the U dicots are by far the most diverse and abundant group of plants that we have on our earth. And their evolution has totally changed and reordered our ecological world we live in. And their economic impacts have enabled us to have the societies that we have now. And they're all just because of these kind of four major clades in this big super group. Okay. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the floral anatomy here of a generic sort of dicot. And I'll talk a little bit about the life cycle in a bit as well. Um, but to start, here we have a flower. And I think we can see that there's recognizable parts, even if you have no experience. You know, you've heard the word often petals. Okay, and so these colorful, but not always, and pronounced, but not always, part of the plant uh, that we sort of identify the flower with is these petals. And these petals all together are called the corolla. And then underneath the petals, we'll often see these smaller green structures called sepals. Okay, and those sepals all together uh, are the calyx, and the calyx and corolla together are all entirely called the perianth. And when we go inside, opening up the flower and we look inside, we see that there's these distinct sets of male and female reproductive organs. And uh, in green, we have the filament with the anthers, uh, my favorite botany joke is, you know, why are 
botanist so smart and it's because they have all the the anthers uh, you can thank dr. Robbins for that um, but but anyways the the anther is where the pollen is generated and so all of that together is the stamen and this here this structure in the center typically we've got a three lobed stigma with this stalk that will eventually have a pollen tube form inside once the pollen from there goes on it called the style we've got this fleshy part of the ovary and inside here is the ovule where the fertilization will take place and we talked about last time double fertilization um, so keep that in mind still and then all of that rests on this receptacle on the stem or peduncle here uh, this all together is called the pistil again and the male is is the stamen and, and finally just a, a note here we see the ovary is above this receptacle above the calyx etc above all of these flower parts and so that is called a superior ovary and then if it were below these floral parts it would be considered an inferior ovary <laughs>